اللهم صل على الحبيب محمد يا رب صل عليه وسلم السلام عليكم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله وبه نستعين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. Um, first of all, thanks very much for inviting me. It's always an honor and a privilege to be able to speak to a Muslim community like this. Um, and uh, but I'm still a professor, and I have to start with a history, a story from history, because I'm a historian. I find the story to be very interesting and useful. The has anyone ever heard of the uh, famous Mughal Emperor Akbar? Yes, a lot of South Asians in the room, I'm sure you've heard of him. So Akbar had this, Emperor Akbar had this interfaith salon he would hold. And in one of the discussions he had, the issue of uh, marriage came up. And he asked, how many wives can a Muslim man have? And the scholars who were present said, they can have four. Uh, so Akbar had way more than four wives. He had way, way more than four wives. And apparently this had escaped his attention until this moment <laughs> when he realized that he had way more wives than he was allowed to have. So he, uh, he asked the scholars you know, what, what he should do. And uh, one person who wasn't a scholar but he said, you know, I recall that the Quran says uh, if you are f- uh, afraid that you will not be just to the orphans, uh, so marriage, marry those methna uh, wa Marry what seems goodly to you from amongst the women, two and three and four. So one and two and three and four is nine. So it's, this is nine women. So maybe you're okay. And uh, Akbar asked other scholars and they, no one would actually give him a fatwa to this, but he was the ruler, so he just did whatever he wanted anyway. The, I, there are two points I want to make with this story. One is that we read the Quran not on our own, but we read the Quran through the sunnah of the Prophet, salam. So the Quran says, marry what seems goodly to you from amongst the women, two and three and four. Now, that was always understood not as two plus three plus four, but two or three or four, one or two or three or four. And we know that from the sunnah of the Prophet, because we know that the Prophet, um, uh, when one of the uh, chiefs of the city of Ta'if, after Ta'if surrendered to the Muslims, one of the chiefs name, was named Ghilan ibn Salama, and he was married to 10 women. And when he became Muslim, uh, he was forced to choose which four he was going to keep as his wives, and the rest he had to divorce. So we know that uh, Muslims who had more than four wives were not allowed to keep more than four wives, except the Prophet, who was a special exception. So we, we know the, the understanding of this verse this Quranic verse from the Sunnah of the Prophet through the Sunnah of the Prophet. And the Sunnah of the Prophet is the lens through which we read the Quran and understand its message. The second point is a little bit, it's slightly off topic, but I think it's very important to keep in mind. It's always important to keep in mind, it's especially important to keep in mind these day, in these days. Namely that uh, it's very hard to, to avoid the political world. It's very hard to avoid the political rule, world and the forces of power and politics will always try and make use of Islamic ideas and of hadiths of the Prophet uh, especially. So you can see here Akbar was just looking for a way to justify what he wanted to do. The sunnah is, the sunnah of the Prophet والسلام, is as one of uh, one great scholar said, it's tatbikun ma'asumun li kitabillah. It is an infallible application of the book of God. The sunnah is the Quran explained by the Prophet ﷺ. Its meaning uh, clarified, its details given, and information added to it. The sunnah is not the same as hadith. The sunnah is the precedence of the Prophet, his example, his teachings. 
And that can take the, it can be transmitted and understood in numerous ways. It can be understood through certain principles. It can be understood through a method of problem solving that his companions inherited and that they then bequeathed to the next generation and they bequeathed to the next generation, to the next generation, to the next generation, and eventually becomes embodied in the schools of law and theology of Muslims. And it's in, it inherited all the way up into the present time by Muslim scholars. But uh, it, it, the, probably the most concrete way in which the Sunnah of the Prophet is embodied is in hadiths, in actual reports about things that the Prophet said, the Prophet did, or things that were done in his presence to which he did not object. Anything done in his presence to which he did not object is understood to be allowed, otherwise he would say something. Now, uh, this is kind of a general talk, but I, I tried my best to, to really sum up what I think are important points for, for you. Hadiths are just pieces of data. So hadiths are just pieces of data. It's very important to keep this in mind because the sunnah is the overall teachings of the prophet, the coherent, consistent teachings of the prophet. Now, hadiths are just reports about things that happen. And sometimes these reports are not representative of the prophet's overall teachings. Just like, for example, if I come to class every day, that's my sunnah, but if I miss class one day because I'm sick, they can be a story. Someone can say, Professor Brown didn't come to class today. But that's not my sunnah. That's just that's a, a true report, but it doesn't represent what I generally do or what I generally uh, advocate. So sometimes these data points can actually be important rules. Some of these data points can be important rules. So when the prophet says, إِنَّمَا الْعَمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ Deeds are determined by intentions. This is a very important principle the Prophet is giving us, alayhi salatu salam. When the Prophet says, لا تبع ما ليس عندك. Don't sell what you don't have. Don't sell what you don't own. This is an extremely important rule. This is a rule that's the basis for much of Islamic buying and selling, Islamic contracts, Islamic finance. It's an extremely important point. It comes from the Prophet's... Uh, a rule that he gives us in his words that's encapsulated in a hadith. These data points can also give important exceptions to these rules. So the Prophet says, don't sell what you don't have, but he gives exceptions too. For example, for farmers who uh, only get their, their income, their crop, one or, once or twice a year, they need to have some form of income the rest of the year so they can buy seeds and buy tools and, and feed their animals and their families. So the Prophet allows people to sell their, uh, promise the sale of their crop in advance in return for money beforehand. This is like a sale on credit. But it has to be that you have to know generally what your crop is, generally how much it yields, so it can't be something totally, uh, uh, totally unknown. This is very important. This is how Muslims know that it's okay to buy and sell things on credit. This is an exception to that general rule that you can't sell what you don't have. Sometimes the prophet, these, these data points that comes from the prophet, uh, sometimes these data points can be extremely important even though it's just one report. So for many, many years during the, the early days of Islam, the Muslims were taught that they would have to do wudu after they ate food that was cooked, cooked by fire. So if you ate, let's say you cooked meat and you, you ate it, you, you couldn't pray without doing wudu. This was a broke your wudu. And then one day, toward the end of his life, the Prophet والسلام, ate a lamb shoulder and he prayed without doing wudu. And he didn't say, oh, that was a mistake. He didn't say that I'm, I, I, I forgot to do wudu. He didn't do wudu and he ate the meat. From that we know that at that point is no longer required for Muslims to do uh, wudu after they eat meat that's cooked by fire. And in indeed, this, this rule ceased to be something that Muslims even know about today. One of the, the most important job of Muslim scholars is and has always been to try and make sense of all these data points. To take the message of the Quran, which is in and of itself sometimes general, sometimes specific, sometimes literal, sometimes metaphoric. So they have to make sense of how the Qur'an relates to itself internally, then they have to make sense of how, of how the Qur'an should be understood through the sunnah of the Prophet. They have, to, they have to find out the relationship between 
the Sunnah and the Quran. And they had to also find out the relationship between the different parts of the Sunnah itself. So which hadith comes, maybe overrules another hadith? Which hadith is general? Which hadith is specific? Which hadith gives you a rule? Which hadith gives you an exception to that rule? So this is the, has always been the job of Muslim scholars. And because it's a process of interpretation, there are always, and there have always been, differences of opinion. And that's why always within Islamic thought, there's been a recognition of acceptable disagreement. Uh, first, you have the companions disagreeing with each other. Then you have the early Muslim scholars disagreeing with each other. At various times, you have even ten, nine or ten different medhebs that exist. And then eventually in Sunni Islam, these are uh, basically pared down to four, Sunni, four medhebs by the 1200s of the Common Era. And in, in, in Shiite Islam, you have the Imami or Jafri school of law. And in Zaydi uh, Islam, you have the Zaydi school of law. You have the Abadi school of law. So these are, the, these are all, all Muslims. And they're all looking at the same sources, but they, their interpretive conclusions are different. Because they're all finding different relationships between parts of the Sunnah, between the Sunnah and the Quran. The other... Sorry. The other major challenge when Muslim scholars have dealt with hadith has been the question of authenticating these hadiths. Unlike the Quran, which was written down by various companions during the life of the Prophet, which was compiled two years after his death by the order of the Caliph Abu Bakr, which was then recompiled again under the reign of the Caliph Uthman, radiallahu ta'ala anhuma, and promulgated officially in 650, around 650 of the Common Era. Unlike the Quran, which is written down very early, and there's only one version of the Quran, there's only one text of the Quran, hadiths are not written down formally. And they're not written down formally for, uh, in any lasting way, for about 150 years after the death of the Prophet. Muslims have been having their own collections of hadith, small collections, private collections, family collections that are passed down from generation to generation. But it's not written down in lasting form until the, the, the mid-700s and even the late 700s. Um, so in that time period, there's a tremendous number of hadiths that are made up, that are made up or mistakenly attributed to the Prophet. And one of the major task of Muslim scholars has been to sort out which hadiths are authentic and which hadiths are unreliable. In order to understand this, we have to answer, answer the question of why Muslims would make hadiths up. And this is something that I think a lot of Muslims find hard to believe. Why would somebody, how would somebody go and consciously attribute something they know is false to the prophet of God, if they believe in that prophet? Well, first of all, a lot of, during the early Islamic period, the number of Muslims who settled in the newly conquered lands was a very small percentage of people. Very small percentage of people. A lot of times people think that Muslims go and they conquer the Middle East and then suddenly the whole map is green and everybody's a Muslim. That's not true at all. Actually, Muslims for many, many centuries were minorities. In, in Iraq, in the year 800, only 18% of Iraq was Muslim. The same year, 800 in, in Andalusia, only 25% of the population was Muslim. Places like Egypt doesn't become majority Muslim until the 1100s. And even in Egypt today, you still have 10, 15% of the population is Christian. So for many centuries, Muslims are a minority. And so lots of people are convert, you know, Muslims are a small number of people. People who are converting are bringing their own ideas. And sometimes they don't know anything about the religion that they're embracing. So sometimes people bring their own cultural ideas, their own religious ideas, and they attribute these to the prophet. Sometimes, and this is a major issue, there are different political agendas. So during the first hundred years of Islam, you have three different civil wars. Sorry, first 150 years. You have three, three civil wars that Muslims fight against each other. And one person says, you know, the Prophet said that Ali should be the Caliph. Another person says, oh, the Prophet said that Muawiyah was the 
second only to Gabriel and being trusted with the words of God. So these are, you know, people making hadiths right, making up hadiths right, left, and center to support their different political causes. Sometimes they would make up hadiths to support their, uh, their theological causes, their theological arguments. This is important to keep in mind today because you can see hadiths being used for political reasons all, or political purposes all the time. I remember after the, the coup against President Morsi in Egypt in 2013, on the Egyptian television, there were all these advertisements saying, you know, for the, for the Egyptian, Egyptian army, and there was one who would cite this hadith that the Prophet ﷺ said that the soldiers of, of Egypt are khayr ajnad al-ard, the best soldiers in the, in the world, saying this is a hadith. This is attributed to the Prophet, but it's an unreliable hadith, very, a very unreliable hadith. And it's made up by people who are partisans of Egypt. In fact, it's somewhat accurate. Egyptian soldiers are very good at killing their own people, but they're not, uh, you know, maybe good at actually fighting wars. Um, people, another major source of, uh, of, of hadith that are misattributed to the Prophet are not instances in which someone's intentionally, intentionally lying about the prophet, but rather it's a mistake. And you can imagine this. A lot of times, if I said, for example, that Saut al Marati Aura, the woman's voice is Aura, has anyone ever heard this before? Yeah. Is that a hadith? Well, you guys are smarter than usual, but most people would say, yeah, that's a hadith. This is not a hadith. It's just some principle, in, especially the Hanafi school of law. That's, but a lot of times it gets attributed to the prophet. Sometimes, even in early, early texts, you'll see things that are companion opinions attributed to the prophet. For example, مَا رَآهُ الْمُسْلِمُونَ حَسَنًا فَوَعِنْدَ اللَّهِ حَسَنًا What the Muslims see as good, is good in God's eyes as well. This is something that is an important principle, but it's not something the prophet said, alayhi salam. It's something that the companion Abdullah bin Mas'ud said. Or you, you'll see a, a, a legal principle like al-mahdurat. Necessity allows the prohibited things. The necessity makes prohibited things allowed. This is, a lot of times you'll see attributed to the Prophet, but it's not a hadith. It's just a legal principle. So sometimes, especially the, the words of companions, the opinions of early Muslim scholars, get pushed back to the Prophet accidentally because you can imagine Muslim scholars are sitting around, they're discussing things over and over again, they're throwing out ideas and somebody mistakes something that's a companion opinion for something the Prophet said. So oftentimes a lot of the hadiths that are uncovered as being unreliable by Muslim scholars are not intentional forgeries. They're not even malicious. A lot of them actually have very good meaning. They're just things that have accidentally been attributed to the Prophet. Finally, it's important to keep in mind that Muslim scholars uh, treated different types of hadiths with different levels of scrutiny. So for classical Muslim scholars, and this is something we know all, going all the way back to the early days of Islam, the hadiths that were most important to them dealt with things like prayer, fasting, contract, zakat, marriage, divorce, aqidah, what we believe about God. These were for them the core areas of religion. And these hadiths they were extremely strict with. That's why most of the time when you hear people talking about hadiths that are controversial, they don't involve things like prayer, they don't involve things like contracts or zakat. What do they involve? They involve things like what's going to happen at the end of the world? What happened at the beginning of the world? Uh, if you do this sin, what punishment will you get in hellfire? If you do this good deed, what reward will you get in heaven? A lot of hadiths, that you, actually, and I've tried to do a study of this, almost all the hadiths that are really controversial today have to do with things happening at the end of the world, things happening at the beginning of the world. These are precisely the areas that Muslim scholars did not actually think were important topics. Because for them, if something happens at the end of the world, first of all, it's not happening now. Second of all, what's the good about knowing, you know, who cares? If something's going to happen in the end of the world, it's going to happen. Like the signs of the last, of the day of judgment. I always get confused. Why is everyone so interested in this? Either the day of judgment's happening or it's not. It shouldn't affect our behavior, right? Um, or what hap how was the world created? Does, doesn't really, this doesn't affect how we live as Muslims or what we believe about God. So these were, the, these were areas of, of, of religion that 
um, Muslim scholars didn't consider it to be as important as the core areas of the Sharia. And this is very ironic because today, if you went out on the street in America and just asked people, you know, tell me something about religion, they'd say, oh, Adam and Eve. They'd say, oh, end of the world. But the, and you, if you ask them, well, what about you know, contracts? What about marriage and divorce? They're like, well, that's not religion. That's, we have law for that. So in the modern period, the situation is exactly the opposite as it was for the early Muslims. And in fact, for Muslims throughout Islamic civilization up until the modern period. Now, the things that were marginal in terms of religion for Muslim scholars, these are now the things that people actually care about. And this is, a, in, in, at least in the United States. So you, you often, you know, probably heard this hadith that the, uh, the prophet supposedly said, تُقَاتِرُونَ الْيَهُودِ حَتَّى يَخْتَبِيَ أَحَدْهُمْ وَرَى حَجَرٍ that the Prophet said, uh, you Muslims will fight the Jews until such a time that Jews will hide behind rocks and trees and until one rock will say, oh Muslim, there's a Jew behind me, so come kill him. So this hadith is about the end of the world. Uh, and, and even if you look at the way Muslim scholars talk about this hadith, they say, we don't really know what it means. Its meaning is unclear. Because this wasn't their primary concern. They didn't, they didn't uh, first of all, they didn't treat these hadiths very skeptically. So they didn't ex uh, analyze them and try and authenticate them in the same way that they dealt with hadiths on prayer, on fasting, on zakat. And second, they, didn't, they weren't even sure what they meant. So a lot of times, the hadiths that we come across today that are controversial, like that hadith I just gave you about you know, Jews hiding behind rocks at the end of, the t at the end of time, these are actually not representative of the hadith that Muslim scholars really tried very hard to authenticate. The lesson that I would like to impart to you, or the, if, if you can take maybe one idea away from my lecture, is that the sunnah of the prophet is the communal inheritance of the Muslims. The son of the Prophet is the communal inheritance of the Muslims. No one person, no one group can hijack the Sunnah of the Prophet. And this has always been the case. The Sunnah of the Prophet is always safeguarded by the Muslim community as a whole. As a whole. So when somebody comes and misrepresents the Sunnah of the Prophet, Muslim scholars will speak out against that. When one group claims to be acting in the name of the Prophet uh, and, and is lying or is pursuing their own agenda or is trying to enrich themselves or do whatever, the Muslim scholars will, 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 will identify that. And they have always done that and they continue to do that until this day. Part of that, the, the, but the thing you have to keep in mind is remember that hadiths, individual hadiths, are just points of data. They're just points of data. And a lot of times I find Muslims, they'll come across hadith and they really get concerned because they don't, want it, they don't know what it means. It seems to mean something that they don't like or something that seems morally objectionable or religiously objectionable to them. And this causes them great concern. What I always tell them is, this is just one piece of information. First of all, it might not be authentic. So don't even, don't even consider reacting to this hadith until you at least know whether Muslim scholars have authenticated it. Second of all, does this hadith deal with something like what's happening at the end of the world or the beginning of the world? Because even if that hadith has been authenticated, it's not something that Muslim scholars actually tried very hard to authenticate. It's sort of like a second level uh, of, of seriousness. They didn't spend that much time dealing with those hadiths. So even if it's something that you find it comes from a reliable source, it might not actually be uh, something that that source considered very seriously. Third, Remember, even if hadith is something that the Prophet said, it always fits into a bigger system. It's always one piece of information that fits into a bigger system. And until you understand its relationship to that system and what that system says, what Muslim scholars as a whole have said on an issue, is no point in reacting. There's no point in reacting. So save yourself the emotional trauma. Save yourself the angst. And... and Always try to remember that any hadith you come across is always part of a bigger system of law and theology. Finally, if you find people or you hear, you hear about people who are hijacking the Sunnah of the Prophet, 
those people do not represent the Prophet's teachings. And Muslim scholars are and will prevent that hijacking from being successful. And those people will not ever represent the religion. Uh, and a gener- generation from now, a century from now, God willing, they'll just be blips, blips on the history, on the radar screen of history, uh, swallowed up in time and ignored, while the, 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 the suad al-adham, the great continuity of the Muslim tradition goes on. Jazakallah khair. Thank you very much.